So the first section we're going to have a look at today is the Acts of the Apostles. And the Acts of the Apostles is, um, as you can see from the screen, the book which follows um, the four Gospels. So it follows Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And this book details the events which occurred um, in, the, in the years after um, the Lord Jesus Christ. So um, at the end of, of the four Gospels we read of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, um, how he's put to death by the authorities and how God then raised him up again and then he ascended into heaven. Um, and Acts um, continues from that finishing point and it details in Acts 1 how Jesus ascended up into heaven and then details in the remainder of the book how the disciples of Jesus um, or, or the apostles, and hence why it can be called the Acts of the Apostles or, or just the Acts, um, how the apostles then preach the word of God to those who they came into interaction with in um, both the Jewish and, um, and the Roman, Roman world at the time, and how they spread um, the gospel, um, which well, is the teachings of, of, of Jesus. And this, this is a, um, a map of um, the type of the, of, um, of the area where they preached, um, um, the area in the time of the Acts of the Apostles, um, and details obviously these key cities uh, such as Jerusalem, where a lot of them, where they originally started preaching from, where obviously they all lived initially, with uh, where Jesus was 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 killed and was raised again, and then we read of places such as Antioch and e e Ephesus, Thessalonica, Rome, um, Athens, all all key places which um, all key places in the Roman world at the time and places which we read of um, in the Acts where the Apostles preached. So I've mentioned the Roman world a few times, and obviously at the time of, of the Acts of the Apostles, um, it was the height of the Roman, um, the Roman Empire. Rome was the world power. Um, but the culture and the language which was spoken in most of the empire at the time um, was Greek, um, with Latin being spoken mainly in, um, in Roman Italy. Um, and that's why most of the New Testament, well all of the New Testament, um, is written in Greek, because that was the, the language spoken at the time. And, and um, obviously, it, well, in the setting of the Roman Empire at the time, um, there were Roman citizens and there were, there were slaves, um, those who um, were subject to someone else who were their slaves, um, and because of the, the Roman setup and the Roman Empire, um, communication was good. Um, the roads were generally quite good between and uh, quite straight between key cities, um, and this helped to this helped to spread the gospel um, to, to to the then known world. Um, as travel travel was relatively good for the apostles as they went throughout the Roman world. Um, and if we can just come to uh, we mentioned before the uh, res um, that the apostles spread um, the word of God, the gospel, um, to those around. If you just come to Acts chapter 1, um, which in, in these Bibles we're using is on page 995. So this is right at the beginning of the Acts. Um, so Jesus has, has died, has been raised again, and um, he is with the disciples and then Acts 1 verse 6, um, read, or 6 to 8 reads, When they <coughs> therefore, and that's the disciples, um, were come together, they asked of Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so Jesus tells the disciples that they would be witnesses to him. They would, they would preach um, the, the teachings which he had taught, and they would preach the gospel. Um, and that would be to both those who were in Jerusalem, as, and, and also those who were in Judea, which was a part of um, the land of Israel, in Samaria, which was the northern part of the land of Israel, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So their preaching would spread 
um, to the ends of the world, to the ends of, um, for example, the Roman Empire, as we saw in the last slide. And then if we just come down a few verses um, in this chapter, um, verse 9. Verse 9, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in like apparel, in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So it is at this stage, after Jesus has told them they will, um, they should go and preach to, um, to, to those in Jerusalem and those in, in the then known world, it is at this point that Jesus um, is then taken up from them into heaven and ascends up to heaven. And we are told there that he would come back in like manner as he had gone. And so there's a prophecy here that the Lord Jesus Christ would return um, return to the earth in the same manner um, in which he had gone. So we're told that Jesus will return to um, return to the earth. And that was the gospel, that was the good news which they would preach, or the, the apostles would preach to um, the Jews and the Gentiles. And um, as they as they then went and preached to um, preached to those who they who who they came into contact with at the various cities that they went to. Um, the disciples preached to, um, to both Jews and also Gentiles. And if we come over to um, Acts chapter 2, um, which is on page 996, um, and from verses 5 to 11, as you, as you see there on the screen, um, so from, uh, from verse 5, this is the day of Pentecost, um, which is 50 days after the Sabbath. So this is 50 days after um, Jesus had been, had been killed. And in verse 5, and we won't read the passage as it's, as it's on the screen, um, but, in, but in verse 5, at this day of Pentecost, um, the, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, um, which we read of in chapter 1. Um, back in chapter 1 verse 5 we read you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you so they received this power on the day of Pentecost and they were then able to speak in tongues um, in different languages um, to those they came into contact with so we see there um, highlighted in, in orange um, a list of those people um, which at this time um, the Apostle Peter was able to preach to on the day of Pentecost and because of the Holy Spirit he was able to preach to all these different people with all their different different languages, and they were able to understand what um, what Peter was saying, um, and that's because Peter had been given the Holy Spirit, and this helped to to spread the the gospel um, throughout um, throughout the then the then known world because the apostles were able to speak to anyone they came into contact with. Language wasn't wasn't a barrier um, to the spread of the gospel. And the part of, um, part of what the apostles preached on this day of Pentecost, um, it, well, what they preached on the day of Pentecost was exactly the same as they preached to, to all the other people they came into contact with. It was about, um, about Jesus, about how he had died and how he'd been risen from the dead. Um, so verse 22 um, to 24 of Acts, part of this speech that Peter gives we read ye men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God have raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it so part of their um, part, part of the gospel which they preached was about the Lord Jesus Christ, and they also preached about the kingdom of God, which would be established upon this earth or will be established upon this earth when Jesus returns to the earth, as we saw in Acts chapter one. And as we go through Acts, we read of the events of um, 
perspective the preaching of the Apostle Peter and also the Apostle Paul, who, who they were both Jews and they both preached to, um, to the Jews and Paul specifically to the Gentiles in various parts of the Roman world. And we, we see how that this gospel spread through, um, through Jerusalem, through Judea, Samaria, and then the rest of, of the world, as, um, as Jesus had told the disciples to do in Acts chapter 1. And as they, as they preached this gospel um, to, to the Jews um, specifically, they faced persecution um, from the Jews, um, because this went against the Jews' teaching. Um, they did not, the Jews, the religious rulers at the time, did not believe that Jesus was, um, was the Messiah and was the Son of God. And so they persecuted them. But this only helped to, um, to further the spread of the gospel. If you just come to Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 9, um, and we just have a look at this, and uh, also just pick up um, the reference to the Apostle Paul, which we mentioned a few moments ago. Um, so Acts chapter 9, and verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, and the phrase there, this way, is referring to those who were following um, the Lord Jesus Christ, who were following the, the disciples, the apostles, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. So they were persecuted as... Um, by by Saul at this time, um, and and we read that as as they um, as they were scattered as um, because of this persecution, that they then preached to um, to many others who they came into contact with. Um, they preached as they as they were persecuted and as they spread. And this man Saul, who we've just read of, who um, who persecuted the early believers, he. Um, Later in, in chapter nine, as he journeyed through Damascus, the Lord um, Jesus met him, um, met him in a vision, and and Paul be, then became a disciple himself. He became, he turned and became a disciple himself. So, um, so the rest of chapter nine, so from verse four, um, four to four to eight, we read of this account where um, the Lord Jesus Christ met. Um, met Saul at the time on, on the road um, to D Damascus and then as we look down the chapter we see how Paul realised that what he was doing was wrong and repented and became a follower of Jesus and a disciple and the rest of the Acts um, of the Apostles from, um, from chapter 11, 11 onwards um, or chapter 12 onwards I think no, 13 onwards um, Pre, um, details the events and the, 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 the preaching of the Apostle Paul um, or mainly the Apostle Paul and we see how he went and preached to those in at the time Asia Minor, so Ephesus and those other places that we looked at on the screen a few moments ago and then if we come to um, the end of the Acts of the Apostles um, Acts chapter um, 28 um, Acts chapter 28, the, the last chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, which is on page 1029. After all these events, um, which we've detailed, um, of Paul's preaching the gospel, in Acts chapter 29, he, he is, oh, sorry, 28, he is, he is jailed, um, and in verse, verse 30 to 31, we read, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So even at this time, even though he was jailed, um, he continued to preach um, the gospel to, um, to anyone who would listen. And the gospel here, we read that it concerned the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Those two things again, and there are many, um, many, many different references in Acts to those two main teachings, um, which formed the gospel, the good news. And so, after or during this period of the Acts, Paul preached in many different cities, and ecclesias or a group of believers were set up in each of 
each of these cities that he visited. And the rest of, of the Bible, um, from Acts um, through, through to Revelation, is a group of letters. Um, and, the majori- and the majority of these letters were written by the Apostle Paul himself. And these letters were letters to the, um, to the believers, to those cities which he had visited. And that was to encourage them in their beliefs. So that's a brief summary of, um, of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and I think next week we'll touch on some of the letters um, which were written shortly after this period. So I'll now hand it over to Mark for the Jews and the Law of Moses. Okay, right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out. Um, so um, we've just looked at the New Testament. We're now going to think back more to uh, Old Testament uh, times. And throughout the course, there's been quite a lot of detail that we've gone through about um, the Jews and um, their, their history. And it's really important that we have a, a good grasp of um, what happens with the Jews who are described in the Bible as a peculiar and a special uh, people. They were people that were chosen um, by God. The, the Bible has hopefully has come out over um, the last few weeks, charts their establishment, um, their origins, um, the, the nation of, uh, of the Jews, um, how they grew, so from the time of King David uh, through to the reign of King Solomon. And then it also records through much of the Old Testament their, their slow decline and um, their unfaithfulness uh, to God, how they were taken captive by various uh, nations. And then um, prophecies relating to the regathering again of Israel, some of which is still being worked out in our day today and uh, will be completed when Jesus uh, returns to the earth. So um, let's just sort of try and encapsulate all that and let's, um, let's just think about who are uh, the Jews? Okay, why are they referred to as uh, Jews? Well... Very simply, the Jews are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And we have to define them in that way, because we can't say that they are just the descendants of Abraham, because um, Abraham uh, is the father of of many nations, including uh, many of the Arab uh, nations, which predominantly come through through Ishmael, uh, one of Abraham's sons. We also can't say that they are the descendants of Abraham and Isaac um, because uh, through Isaac um, and his son Esau, so Isaac had two sons, uh, Esau and Jacob, through, um, through Esau uh, came uh, the Edomites, uh, non-Jews. So we have to define them as descendants of Abraham, Isaac and of Jacob because Jacob's uh, 12 sons were to become um, the 12 tribes of um, Israel. So um, that defines them in terms of their, their descent, but they're also they're referred to as, as, as the Jews, as it were, but they're also referred to as Hebrews. And you, might, um, you may or may not know uh, the background to, to that, uh, but the, word, the Hebrew word occurs, first of all, back in the book of Genesis. So let's have a look at it. It's in Genesis chapter 14. And it was Abraham who was first called uh, a Hebrew. And uh, Abraham got involved in uh, the rescue of, um, of Lot here in Genesis chapter 14. And uh, if we come down to verse um, 13 of uh, Genesis chapter 14, it says, um, And there came one that had escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew... For he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Amnon, and these were confederate with Abraham. And so Abraham was first called a Hebrew here in um, Genesis chapter 14. And Hebrew, um, it's a derivation of um, uh, Eber. Um, and Eber was um, one of the um, grandfathers of uh, Abraham. Uh, he was a sixth generation descendant of, of Eber. That's Abraham. And Eber's name means one who crosses over. Okay, so a Hebrew, um, if we were to look at the meaning of the word Hebrew, it is a crosser over. 
And that's um, very significant in the life of Abraham and very significant um, in terms of what all true Jews uh, should do. Uh, because Abraham, if you remember that he originally lived in, in Ur of the Chaldees, a very pagan um, city, um, not God-fearing at all. Um, and he had to leave that city and he crossed over uh, the river Euphrates and he was told to go to a land that God would um, give him, uh, which is the land of, of Israel. So he, he crossed over literally um, a river, uh, but also he crossed over... Uh, spiritually, as it were, he um, he went from this pagan culture uh, to a believer and a follower of um, the true uh, God. And as a result of that, because Abraham crossed over, um, that God um, made uh, various promises uh, to Abraham. So let's have a look at, I think we've probably touched on these before. Let's remind ourselves. Let's look at Genesis chapter 12, first of all. Genesis chapter 12 and um, verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, and that was to become the land of Israel. I will make thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So Abraham was promised um, to be given a land that he would be, uh, become a blessing. Uh, if we come over to, uh, to chapter 13, uh, we've got more details of this in terms of the land that was promised. Um, verse, verse 15, uh, well verse 14 for connection. And the Lord said unto Abraham, after that Lot had separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward and westward, for all the land that thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed uh, be numbered. So he's promised this great nation, which was to become the Jews, and also um, Arab nations as well. Um, but specifically, Abraham was promised the land, uh, north, south, east, and uh, west. Now, we said that to be a Jew, you had to be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and uh, Jacob. And these promises uh, were repeated uh, to um, those descendants. So if we go to Genesis chapter 26... Um, to Isaac first of all Genesis 26 and uh, verse verse 3 sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham uh, thy father and this is God here speaking to uh, Isaac and he's giving the same promises that he gave to Abraham uh, to, uh, to Isaac. And then um, to complete the picture, if we come over a couple of chapters to Genesis chapter 28. Um, so to Isaac's son Jacob. Um, Genesis chapter 28 and verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father. The God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and then in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So we see this progression of promises um, being repeated over and over. So um, with Jacob, um, Jacob had um, 12 sons, and um, very famously, of course, one of his sons, Joseph, went down into Egypt. Um, there was then a famine in the land and the rest of the brothers ended up down in Egypt as well. And it was in Egypt that the, um, that family grew, became very prosperous, became a very large family. But they were under oppression um, by, the, by the Egyptians. And then um, in Exodus, uh, we have the, uh, the history recorded where, um, where Moses is um, commissioned to go and free God's people from the hand of Pharaoh and bring them back to um, the land of Israel. Now, um, the point of, of that is that um, when Moses brought them out of um, Egypt, and it's a very dramatic part of the scriptures, it's a great story, um, but when, he, when he came out of, of um, Egypt, they were no longer just a family, um, but they were now a nation. They'd grown uh, in size to be 
a nation, and that nation needed to be, to be governed. They needed rules, they needed organisation. And so um, on Mount Sinai, as they began their wilderness wanderings before they went into um, the land of Israel, back to the promised land, uh, Moses was given by God um, what's referred to as the, the law of Moses and um, a lot of Exodus and parts of Deuteronomy and Leviticus um, details that. So um, part of the law of Moses is the Ten Commandments, um, which I'm sure we are um, familiar um, with. But it wasn't just the, um, the ten, ten Commandments uh, that, that was given. Um, the law of, of Moses, which is really the law of God, because God gave it um, to Moses, it established an order of worship. So it established a, a priesthood, um, which was the, the Levites, and it established a focus of, um, of worship, um, which was um, the tabernacle, which was the place where um, God um, would, would dwell with, with his people. Um, and uh, you probably remember from the Bible exhibition, there was a very good uh, model of the tabernacle um, in, the, in the Bible exhibition. Uh, but the tabernacle was a, was a tented um, structure and um, in, the, in the tabernacle there were um, various places for uh, washing, um, for carrying out uh, sacrifices and there's lots of details of sacrifices that were given uh, under, under the law. And then you have these two very special places, the holy place and uh, the most holy place. In the holy place was the seven branched uh, lampstand or seven branched candlestick to provide uh, the light, uh, the altar of incense and the table of showbread. And then in the most holy place, and only the high priest could go into the most holy place, was the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant um, had inside it uh, the, um, the Ten Commandments and it also had Aaron's rod um, that, that budded. And it was on this place here on the Ark of the, the Covenant, that God's glory, the manifestation of God's glory, uh, was to dwell. So that was the focus of, um, of Israel. The law of uh, Moses, um, it was designed to govern the people, to bring order uh, to um, society. And, and much of that law was, was very much ahead of its time. So, it has very detailed uh, laws of cleanliness, uh, details of uh, what could be eaten and what couldn't be eaten. And God said to Israel um, in Exodus that if they were to keep this law, then they wouldn't have the diseases of, of Egypt. Um, and, and modern science today has shown that the law of Moses, um, in terms of the, the health of the nation, um, did just that. You know, it was very different to um, what the Egyptians were doing or the other nations around um, that, that were doing. So it had real med um, medicinal benefits uh, to them. Um, it also, it's not all of the law of Moses was um, for order or for cleanliness and, and so forth, but it, it was also had a, a very real purpose um, in terms of showing Israel that they were separate, that showing the Jews that they were a special people, that they were a people that were dedicating themselves um, to God. Um, and so that's something that, that also needs to be borne in mind when we think about um, the law of Moses and when we read about it and you sometimes think, well, why, why were they told to do this? Why was that important uh, for them? And it was to teach them uh, how to worship God, that they were a holy, special people. Let's go to um, Isaiah's prophecy now. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. And uh, we're going to have a look at a quotation about um, this law. So Isaiah chapter 2. And I'll give you the page number when I get there. Um, so we're on page 643. Isaiah chapter 2. <coughs> And verse 2 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the, of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. 
For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from um, Jerusalem. Now, this is a, a prophecy which I suggest hasn't been fulfilled um, yet. Um, see, we need to read verse 4 as well, which says, And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war uh, anymore. And um, this, this last quote here, very famously, is um, in the UN, uh, that the UN use this uh, quote here from Isaiah, talking about peace among um, the nations. Now, this will only happen, uh, according to the Bible, when Jesus returns and when he establishes God's kingdom again on the earth. And, and many of the things that we read about under the law of Moses, under the things that were given to the Jews, um, that were being reinstated when Jesus returns. So, uh, Jesus is going to um, do these things from um, the Lord's house. So uh, Ezekiel tells us that a temple is going to be built um, in Israel, in Jerusalem, uh, a bit like the, the tabernacle or the temple in Solomon's time and so forth. And that God's laws, God's word, uh, is going to go out from this place. Um, and, and we read that uh, in these verses as well. Uh, and that's how... What was originally promised to Abraham, that all nations of the earth would be blessed, that's how that part of the prophecy would be fulfilled as well. Okay, so what happened then to, to the Jews? What happened to the Jewish um, peoples? Well, we've reflected on this uh, already, um, that they, through their wilderness wanderings, they went into... Um, Israel, they had their period of time under the judges and then the kingdom of Israel was established under David and Solomon and then they went into a period of um, decline uh, because of their unfaithfulness so we need to ask the question then is the Jews or are the Jews still relevant uh, in God's purpose today according to the Bible well let's go to the New Testament now let's go to the book of Romans in chapter 10 because uh, Peter was thinking about the preaching of Paul and the spread of the gospel um, just after the time of Jesus and in Romans chapter 10 uh, Paul says this he says so we're on page uh, 1038 uh, Romans chapter 10 verse 1 Paul says brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So uh, Paul wanted um, Israel um, to be uh, saved. And if we come over to the next chapter, to Romans chapter 11. So are the Jews still relevant today? Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? Uh, God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not that the scripture saith of Elias, how that he maketh intercession to God against um, Israel. So very clearly that verse is telling us that God still has this purpose um, with, with the Jews, uh, that he hasn't um, cast them off as it were, and that they still have a part to play in the things that, um, that God is going to bring to pass on this earth when Jesus returns. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 28. We were there not very long ago with Peter. And do you remember we looked at um, the last few verses of Acts chapter 28 where um, Paul was uh, preaching, remember we looked at verse 31, so we're on page 1029, verse 31, that Paul was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man uh, forbidding him. Well, I want you to note um, verse 20 of this um, chapter. As Paul says here, For this cause therefore have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. So Paul's was preaching the gospel, he's preaching the kingdom, he's preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's terming it the hope of Israel. 
So there's this great connection then between the preaching of the apostles, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and everything that had been promised to the Jews in the, in the Old uh, Testament. The two are uh, inextric- inextricably linked. Um, and uh, if we went on in this chapter, it says that uh, he was persuading them concerning Jesus both out of the law of Moses and of the prophets. So you need to, we need to look at both, both parts um, of that. And, and ultimately, um, at the return of Jesus, um, the Jews at the moment reject Jesus as their Messiah. Um, but at the return of Jesus, um, the Jews, um, according to prophecies in the Bible, that they will accept him uh, as, their, as their king. Right, our time is going. Um, there's a number of prophecies that um, we'll just quickly flick through these because um, they're, they're really interesting in relation to, to the Jews. Um, we won't turn them up, but do look at them in your own time. God said things like this about Israel. So this is in the book of Deuteronomy, so very on in their, early on in their history. Um, he said this, he said, The Lord shall scatter thee among all people, and among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. Thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have non-assurance of thy life. And, and that happened when the Jews went into Babylon, into captivity, and it's happened... More recently than that, um, AD 70, for example, uh, the Jews were scattered out of the land of Israel. Think of the time of the Holocaust. Um, their life will hang in doubt before the terrible, terrible events. Um, but this prophecy has become um, remarkably fulfilled. But has God forsaken them? Well, Deuteronomy 30 says, Thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations with the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and thou shalt return to the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations with the Lord thy God hath scattered thee, and now the Jews have a land again. The same land that was promised to Abraham, the land of Israel. So this prophecy has come remarkably true and uh, these verses say very similar and then um, in Jeremiah's prophecy and there's many prophecies that are similar to this uh, Jeremiah chapter 30 says therefore fear thou not O Israel for lo I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of their captivity for I am with thee saith the Lord to save thee though I make a full end of all nations whither I have scattered thee yet will I not make a full end of thee and we think about Babylon no longer exists as an empire Although it was incredibly powerful at the time, Jews were taken into captivity in Babylon. The Romans, they're no longer uh, an empire. Um, they've been made an end. But God has preserved his people. He's not going to make a full end of them. And um, he says that he's going to save them. And that's inextricably linked with the return of um, Jesus. Okay. Peter. Thanks, Mark. Right, so we want to have a look now at um, our fourth, fourth section in, in the section um, sections of Bible terminology. And tonight, um, depending on time, we're going to have a look at some of the words on the screen. Um, and to start with, we're going to have a look at those highlighted in orange, um, particularly <coughs> the, um, Satan and the devil. Because the Satan and the devil are... Um, often things which um, can be, or words which can be un- misunderstood, um, and this hasn't necessarily been helped by various um, representations of the devil or, or Satan um, and various literary uh, writings. So, firstly, the sa- uh, Satan. What does the word Satan um, mean when we read it in our Bibles? Well, if you have a look in. Um, Look at, look at a concordance. The word Satan literally means an adversary, someone who opposes someone else. And sometimes we get the idea um, from different writings or different pictures, different teachings, that Satan or, um, and the devil, which we'll come on to in a minute, are some sort of supernatural being who influence people um, for evil. But here we see that Satan literally means an adversary. 
And rather than just uh, just taking my word for it, we'll have a look at a couple of biblical passages um, which which um, which support this and uh, where the word is used. So, firstly, can you come to one Chronicles chapter twenty one? So 1 Chronicles chapter 21, um, which is on page 432, sorry, 431, um, you want the verse 1. So verse 1 we read, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So here, this, this, uh, this Satan stands up against Israel and provokes David to number Israel. So we might, we might think from that passage that Satan is an individual. But if you just come to the parallel record in 2 Samuel chapter 24, um, which is on page 345, um, we see that we have something slightly different recorded for us. And of course, it's telling us about the exact same events um, from, um, from a different writer's viewpoint. And here, the, the word of God, the Bible, indicates to us what this Satan is. So 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. And that's very similar to what we read in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. So in Chronicles we read Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And here in 2 Samuel 24... We read that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he provoked David or moved David against them. So we see here that, um, that God is Satan, that God is the adversary. And of course, if you, if you believe that Satan is a supernatural being who is opposed to God, then it doesn't make sense for Satan to be God, um, otherwise you're opposing yourself. And so we see that... Um, that God was an adversary, he, was, he opposed David at this time. And it was because of David's, David's pride that he then numbered, um, numbered, the, numbered the children of Israel to see how mighty he had, how, how many men he had um, to go and fight, um, fight various battles. But we see that God was Satan, so therefore, and Satan being literally um, the meaning of an adversary, it makes sense for God to be, a saint, for God to be Satan in this sense. God was literally just an adversary against David. And another example, if you come to um, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, which is on page 892. Um, Matthew 16 and verse 21. Uh, so just read verse 21 to 23. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offence unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So here, Jesus is telling the apostles and the disciples um, what was going to happen to him, how he would die and then be raised again. But Peter um, stands up against Jesus and tells him um, that this is not going to happen to him. And Jesus knew that what was going to happen to him, how he was going to be killed and raised again, was, um, was, was the will of God. And so and Jesus says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was acting as an adversary against Jesus. He was acting against Jesus. He was opposing Jesus. And so Jesus calls him Satan, um, or literally just calls him adversary. Um, because the word Satan is not, um, not, a, um, not a proper noun. And, that, and where we see it, with, um, often with a capital S, um, as we've got at the top of the screen, um, it shouldn't really have a capital S. It's not a proper noun, it's literally just an, a word meaning an adversary. So that's adversary. 
So the next word is the devil. And again, we um, sometimes get a very similar picture um, of the devil, don't we? Something um, with horns, um, red with a pitchfork um, and a tail. Um, so, and again, sometimes portrayed as a supernatural um, being who, again, similar to, similar to Satan, sometimes people believe they're the same thing, um, opposes God um, for evil. But again, if we have a look in a concordance, um, or, or if you have a look at a concordance or a Bible dictionary, we see that the word um, devil, sorry, devil literally means a false accuser or a slanderer. So someone who is accusing someone falsely. And again, we'll have a look at a biblical example. Um, just come to John chapter 6. Uh, John chapter 6, which is on page um, 975. Um, at the end of John chapter 6, um, verse, well, v- verse 66, um, From that time many of Jesus' disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Um, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. So Jesus, this time, instead of being an, um, an adversary or Satan against Jesus, is, um, is believing in Jesus and um, believes that he is the Son of the living God. And then verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So this time, the, um, Jesus um, calls Judas a devil. He says that one of his twelve disciples was a devil. And of course, he doesn't mean that one of his disciples was the supernatural being who was opposed to God, but rather one of his disciples was a false accuser or a slanderer. And if we um, if we know the story of the uh, of the death of, of Jesus, how he was be- he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot, as we saw in verse thirty one, it was he who would betray him. Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus um, and was a false accuser, um, which eventually led to Jesus being put to death. So again, similar to um, to Satan, devil um, the, the word devil again shouldn't have a capital letter, isn't a proper noun. Um, but rather just means a false accuser or a slanderer, someone who is falsely accusing someone um, in some way or other. So that's Satan and devil. And related to that um, is the word Lucifer. And many people um, might believe that um, the word Lucifer is the name of the devil and that Lucifer or, or the devil is a fallen angel. Um, who, who was an angel who then um, did evil and became the devil and again literature and art has, has distorted this view but the, the word Lu- uh, Lucifer only occurs once in, um, in the Bible and that is in Isaiah chapter 14 so if we just have a look at that so Isaiah chapter 14 which is on page 652 Um, Isaiah 14 and verse 12 it's the only time we read of the word Lucifer so verse 12 how art thou fallen from heaven O Lucifer son of the morning how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations and if you have a bible with a central margin um, it might tell you that the word Lucifer um, literally means morning star or light bearer um, as as it says on the screen and so some people might um, use this passage or might interpret this passage to make, show that the, the Lucifer is a fallen angel and um, how are they cut down to the ground, fallen from heaven. But if we, if we look at the context of the word, um, we see that it's in the middle of a prophecy um, which Isaiah is giving. So if we go to verse 1 of this prophecy, um, so Isaiah chapter 14, um, sorry verse 4, um, that thou shalt take up this proverb, um, and then goes on to give prophecy, against the king of Babylon. So this prophecy is against the king of Babylon. 
And you can follow prophecy down from verse 4. How um, God is prophesying, um, prophesying and Isaiah is giving this prophecy um, against the king of Babylon. How he would be, he would be destroyed. So, for example, there's many different um, types. Verse 8. Um, verse 8. Since thou art laid down, um, no fellow has come up against us. Um, and it goes on to show how, verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave. Um, verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven? So we can see how um, this, this prophecy is against the king of Babylon. It's not against a... Um, against a, an angel which has fallen. So again, Lucifer lich, um, literally means the morning star and is referring to the king of Babylon. Oops, sorry, I should have been that before. Um, so the next word we want to consider is the word saint. And again, this is another word which can sometimes be misrepresented. misrepresented. And the word saint um, the word saint occurs a number of times um, in the Bible, and particularly in the New Testament. And the word means um, means holy. And we looked at a few weeks ago how um, the word holy um, means separate um, in some way or other. And this this word here, where we read the word saint, is referring to the believers um, in Jesus, believers in God, those who. Have, are separate in that they have separated themselves um, from, from the world around them, from um, other teachings, and separated themselves to God. And we'll just have a look at a few of these um, these references, because the word saint is used on um, at the beginning of most of the letters which we referred to earlier in the New Testament. So if you just come to the, book, um, the letter to the Ephesians, um, which is on page 1072, We'll just have a look at um, at three letters. I've chosen three quite close together, just to make it easier to go between them. So, at the beginning of the letter to the Ephesians, page 172, we read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And if you just come over a few pages to uh, the beginning of Philippians, uh, page 1077, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. And then again over to Colossians, again just a few um, pages forward, and this time page 1081. And again, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So Paul begins these three letters, and many of his other ones, but we won't, we won't turn up all those, um, begins many of his letters to the saints which are at a certain place. And he's referring to the believers which are in that place, in the, um, the early church, in the early ecclesia. Um, it is those who were separate, were holy, who had separated themselves and believed in God. So saints is referring to those who believe in God. And then another word we want to have a look at is that of angel. The word angel appears many times um, in the Bible, and as you can see on the screen, it's, it's translated angel um, 111 times, but shortly follows afterwards is the translated messenger um, 98 times. And the word angel um, literally just means um, a messenger or a representative, someone who is sent out to deliver a message to other people and when we see the word angel or messenger um, in the Bible it's important to have a look at the context of that word um, the context in which the word is used to see whether um, the word is referring to just a messenger just someone who is delivering a message or whether it is referring to the um, the immortal angels um, the, the, the angels of God so we just need to make sure that when we read in the Bible, when we come across this word angel or messenger, that we just have a look at the context um, to see which one, which reference is what it's referring to, whether it's referring to an immortal angel or 
um, someone who is mortal, who is just delivering a message. So that's the five um, key words which we're going to have a look at this evening. I think our time's gone, so we won't look at any more. Um, but the, the, um, the definitions and a reference um, which you can have a look at to help your understanding of that meaning, of that word, um, of those words on the screen, I believe can be found on page 80 of the workbook. Um, so please have a look at those um, at your leisure just to have a look and understand what those words what those words mean. But hopefully that's given you um, an indication of those five key words um, and five key teachings um, that which, we, which we come across within the Bible. So I think that's it for that section. So um, I'll hand back to Mark for the summary. Right. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so we've covered uh, a fair bit of ground uh, this evening. Um, we've looked at the, the Acts of the Apostles, the preaching of the Gospel, um, how, the, uh, how the Gospel went, started in Jerusalem, went out to Judea and Samaria, and then to the four corners of the earth, the then known world being the Roman Empire. Uh, we looked at the rev- re- relevance of the Jews, the Lord Moses, um, the importance of them uh, in God's plan and purpose, and how that still continues today. And uh, we've touched on some Bible terminology. So, thank you all very much for coming out.